Hello, everyone, and welcome. In honor of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, Mayor Brown is pleased to host today's session, Perspectives on Asian American Diversity in the Legal Sector. My name is Grace Shi, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office, where I focus on global mobility and migration, representing multinational companies on the movement of their people across borders. I'm joined by my litigation partner, Arcus Parasharami, who is also based in Washington, D.C., where he serves as co-chair of the firm's consumer litigation and class actions practice and a member of a Supreme Court and appellate practice. We are lucky to welcome today as our speakers a distinguished group of in-house counsel who have graciously offered to share their experience and their perspectives on today's topic. I will keep my introductions of them brief because it's more important that you hear from them directly. But first, let me introduce George Chang, who serves as General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer for the Volion Group. George, get a quick wave. Thank you. The Volion Group is committed to the development and employment of cutting-edge technologies in investment management. George began his career at Aiken Gump and has worked as Vice President and Assistant General Counsel in the Asset Management Division of Goldman Sachs, General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer of Rock Bay Capital Management, Head of Legal and Chief Compliance Officer at GLG Inc., and Senior Vice President and a member of the Legal Department at DE Shaw. George is based in Berkeley, California. Next, we welcome Mingxian Elders, who is Senior Counsel in the regulatory banking and insurance legal team at American Express. She advises on bank and bank holding company regulatory matters. Prior to joining American Express, Ming Shen worked in the banking and financial services group at Sidley Austin, and she is based in Washington, D.C. Next, we have Patrick Fang. Patrick is senior counsel on Accenture's contracting team, where he is responsible for negotiating large and complex deals including systems integration, business process outsourcing, IT modernization, and cybersecurity transactions. He serves as lead counsel and business advisor for Accenture's Midwest Health and Public Service Client Portfolio. Patrick is also the lead for the Accenture Employee Resource Group for Asian American and Pacific Islander legal professionals in North America. Prior to joining Accenture, Patrick was a commercial litigator in New York City, working in the complex financial institutions litigation practice for Bingham McCutcheon. Patrick, too, is based in the Washington, D.C. area. And we have Ken LaCroix, currently serving as an executive attorney at General Motors. He uh, leading various strategic transactions with key third-party relationships that impact GM's product portfolio. Ken also supports the EV growth operations team, headed by GM's chief EV officer, to help grow GM's key electric vehicle business, which is a key part of GM's vision towards a future of zero crashes zero emissions, and zero congestion. Thank you to all the speakers for joining us today. We're here today to, to share a dialogue on Asian American diversity in the legal sector. I, I will first invite our speakers to share their personal and professional backgrounds, weaving in the role that their Asian American heritage has played in their lives, in their education, in their careers. We'll then address a few different topics today. One, the challenges or advantages of the role that their Asian American heritage has played in their careers, the role of Asian American diversity, equity, and inclusion in their organizations, whether past or present, their observations on the promotion and the progress of the promotion of Asian Americans into leadership roles, and their thoughts on what the future holds for Asian Americans in the legal profession. Archis, will you tell the group about the Q&A feature that we have today? I sure will. Uh, and thank you, Grace, for all your work in putting this together. I, we have a tremendous turnout. Uh, over 260 folks are logged on. And you know, for that reason, I think uh, it, it makes sense to try and do some managing of questions and answers. And there's a question and answer box that's in the, I think, the lower right corner of your screen. And we can take questions that way. And, and Grace and I will try and uh, have as many of those questions answered by the panel as we can. And we'll, we'll seek to moderate it. But that's the place to, to plug in your questions if you have them. And feel free to ask as you go along. We'll try to work them in. Thank you. 
And um, first off, thank you to the speakers. You have all agreed to start today's discussion and dialogue by, by getting personal, by sharing a little bit of your personal background. Um, I'll invite each of you to identify your Asian heritage and tell us what I'm referring to as your personal diversity journey, whether it be growing up Asian American uh, in the United States, your education, or working as an Asian American legal professional in, um, in the United States. I think we will uh, start off with George to kick off today's session. Over to you, George. Great. Um, thanks, Grace, and uh, thanks, Arches, very much for inviting me. I'm uh, uh, really excited to um, be here and to kind of participate with my other panelists in uh, Mayor Brown's events for AAPI um, uh, Asian Heritage Month. And so, um, I, I guess a little bit about me, kind of my background. Um, my parents were, uh, my father was from um, southern China, and my mom grew up in Hong Kong. Uh, they both immigrated to Canada. Um, uh, for kind of their university. And so I'm actually Canadian by birth, um, but um, <clears throat> largely, I guess, Texan by upbringing because we moved there when I was relatively young. Um, uh, although I, I, I moved away kind of after college and um, haven't spent that much time there um, since. Um, you know, and I think that uh, just kind of a little bit about the kind of the growing up part. Um, Houston at the time we moved there um, in the 70s was still kind of, you know, a, a kind of a developing city and I think a bit provincial at times. Um, but overall, I mean, you know, we had a really, uh, you know, kind of the people were sort of generally nice and schools were great and kind of all of those sorts of things. I, I think that one of the things that really, as I was thinking about this question, stood out to me um, sort of as a as an important moment in in my development uh, or kind of i guess the formation of my my um my identity uh was when we were in high school and kind of having a you know a nice kind of conversation with a bunch of friends and um uh, one of my acquaintances at the time said you know i have never thought of you um, as chinese and at the time um i thought it was a compliment um but i think i reflected on it a little more and I think it, to me, sort of brought forth or brought into relief um, a tension that we face often with um, both trying to fit in to the predominant culture, um, but also trying to um, kind of navigate or negotiate our own identity. You know, and um, that somewhat, uh, that kind of comment has stayed with me for longer than I would have expected, um, because I think this continues to really um, be true in uh, our professional lives, right? Uh, I, in general, as you move up kind of the ranks of both the legal sector as well as um, kind of corporate America, uh, it tends to be, I think, you know, less diverse sort of on a number of dimensions than even kind of ordinary society. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that, so I do have, have spent kind of a lot of time thinking about um, Kind of what it means to fit in, right? And you know, when you sort of first begin your career, you're really focused on sort of just kind of continuing the success and 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 sort of doing the things that have gotten you to the place where you are already. Um, uh, but I think we will sort of encounter um, uh, questions about uh, or sort of opportunities to to um, think about our identity or discuss our identity <clears throat> will come up. Right or kind of concerning behaviors or other things, I have to say that even in um, kind of over my you know career, sort of over the past 20, 20 plus years, I have noticed a real shift in the willingness of companies to be talking about these issues. Right, and I think that that has been um, due to kind of a lot of the tremendous kind of uh, uh, ground level activity um, <clears throat> that has occurred um, and that we are seeing in in sort of the consciousness of um, uh, of folks generally. And, you know, because I think it sort of when I first started out, it was very much just you sit in, you sit down and you put your nose to the grindstone and you work tremendously hard um, and you don't really talk about stuff sort of outside of work. Now, uh, you know, today we have conversations pretty regularly about um, 
the values that companies stand for, the positions they take. And um, I know that some people uh, are, are don't like, I think that what they view of as a kind of a slightly more political environment. But I think from my perspective, it has been good because it has been allowed, it has allowed these types of conversations um, to occur. And I think that especially as we see um, uh, sort of more people of diverse backgrounds kind of um, um, uh, rising within organizations um, and a willingness to say, you know what, like, um, I would like to hear, you know, what the company thinks about, um, you know, sort of the protests in Hong Kong or uh, Black Lives Matter or kind of any number of things. Um, and it is pushing uh, kind of founders who are, you know, typically, at least in my generation, right, a, a generation or two above me, um, into harder questions where they didn't really have to confront these issues. Um, so I will, I think, leave it at that. I don't want to kind of go over too long. I know that I'm starting to get into a number of topics that are for later in the presentation. So I'll be happy to sort of speak about that further, but I wanted to turn it back to Grace. Thank you, George. Ming Xie, over to you. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Um, thanks uh, to, to Grace and Arches for hosting this conversation. I'm really thrilled to be part of this panel and to share some of my stories today. I didn't actually realize that um, that George was from Texas, but I am too. So in terms of my personal personal journey, so I was born in Taiwan and my family came here when I was a baby, less than one years old. Um, or maybe less than two. My mom is not not great with with the dates, um, but I grew up in a town called Flower Mound, Texas, which is outside of Dallas. So actually, because Houston and Dallas are basically different countries, it's it's not so similar. Um, but when you when you grow up in a town called Flower Mound, you don't expect a lot of diversity, and that was true. Virtually everybody in my hometown was white, and in my grade. I went to school with one other Asian person, and and as you guys can imagine, we are still friends today. Um, I, I loved growing up in Texas, and I have a proper appreciation of Frito pie and chicken fried steak, and that, that's the stuff you would eat at the school cafeteria. But when I, I got home, uh, my mom would feed me what she called real food, so we had we had both sides of the house. Um, things were hard. Uh, we were an immigrant family trying to make ends meet. My dad had an engineering degree, but he worked construction in Texas, and he picked up any additional handyman jobs that he could. My mom had a teaching degree from the best teaching college in Taiwan, but she had no family support in Texas, so she didn't have the grandmas and the aunties to take care of kids. So instead she stayed home and then um, after a while she got some jobs. She worked at Chinese restaurants, she worked as a secretary, she worked as a receptionist. So she, they, they did what they had to do to get by, but they didn't work up to their potential so that we could live here, um, which is, you know, very common. So I got a lot of financial aid for college. I got myself through law school with a ton of student loans, and both in undergrad and in law school. I was actually really thrilled to see the diversity there, very different than when I grew up. And, and then I went to the big law firm, and somehow um, that diversity shrunk uh, substantially, particularly among the partners. Um, uh, and it, in some ways, it felt like I was back in Flower Mound again, even though I was living here in Washington, D.C. So one of the um, early reviews I got from one of, one of my white male partners was that I was smart but quiet. And uh, anyone who knows me knows that I'm actually not quiet at all. Um, but there was an expectation that I would be quiet and... So there was a perception that I was quiet. And I knew that at that moment, it was gonna be hard for me to be seen as anything other than an Asian woman. And that um, I would need to work really hard to make connections 
and to advance. So, so I did that. Uh, I put in the work, I made the connection, and today I find myself at American Express. Back to you, Grace. Thank you. Both Mingxin and I were born in Taiwan and came to the States as, as very young children, so we and, uh, definitely have that in common. Thank you, Mingxin. Uh, over to you, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks, Grace and Arches, for inviting me here. I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Um, so to better understand my perspective, I'm going to talk about my family a little bit more in detail. I was born and raised in Virginia, so I'm American through and through, but my parents were born in Taiwan. They, along with my grandparents, emigrated to the U.S. in the 60s and 70s, respectively. My grandmother on my father's side, she was a university physics professor in Taiwan. So when she came over here in the early 60s, she spent a few years to obtain her master's degree in physics from George Washington University, after which, um, after which she then landed a job at NASA where she became a rocket scientist. Um, to my knowledge, she was the only female Asian rocket scientist that worked on the Apollo 11 lunar landing mission that sent Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon. Um, her, her son, my father, after college, uh, joined the US Navy, where he served in active duty and in the reserves for 20 years. In 1972, he was one of three Asians in a class of 90 officers. And I distinctly remember stories that he told me where he was based in Jacksonville, Florida at the time, he would be regularly saluted on base because he was an ensign officer. But as soon as he stepped off base in his civilian clothing, it wouldn't take long before he'd be met with racial insults and comments telling him to go back to China. So. This is all relevant to me growing up as an Asian American because I recognize, based on my family's history, the duality of identities that we struggled with. The idea of having to always overcome this perception of being a foreigner and for some reason having to defend how American we are or how loyal and patriotic we are to this country. And when I look at my family's history on paper, at least, I really can't point to a gap in where you know, my my first generation immigrant grandparents and parents could have contributed more to the values of American society or exhibited patriotism. And yet we still struggled with some of these perceptions and uh, racial biases. So that really kind of informed, you know, the the awareness in me of what it means to be Asian American. I wish I had joined the legal profession for for these reasons. It wasn't a noble cause at all. I'm going to be fully transparent. I'm actually a product of a different Asian American stereotype. When I was growing up, I kind of had three career options. I could be a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. So I basically chose the path of least resistance at my at the time in my mind. And you know, it's it's worked out pretty well for me since since then. But um, that's a little bit about my family background. Over to you, Grace. Thank you, Patrick. And Ken, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Can you hear me okay? All right. So um, hearing hearing these stories, by the way, thank you both Arches and Grace for, for inviting me to this. Pleasure to be here. I'm gonna pivot. Uh, I had I had some points that I wanted to to raise, but I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot to just share a few stories that I think will highlight the the perspective I bring. So I guess um, I will start off with my mother is uh, Japanese. My father is from the U.S. with a background of, you know, French, British, the, the whole mix, uh, along with Native American. So I belong also to the Cherokee Indian tribe. Um, it used to be of Alabama. Now I think it merged with North Carolina. Um, but I grew up, I was born in the States, in Cincinnati, Ohio. My first schooling was in Caracas, Venezuela. I then moved to Japan for grades up through grade eight. And I came back to the States for high school. So my English isn't too bad, but growing up, it was uh, it was interesting to hear, you know, I come to the US, so my grandparents on both sides uh, fought against each other in World War II. Very strong sentiments both ways. Um, growing up in Japan, 
Uh, I went to an international school, but on Wednesdays, Wednesday nights, you know, from what, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. was extra school. Saturdays were Japanese extra school. I took the train every day, I got up, tried to, try to beat my dad, get on that 6.18 a.m. train for an hour commute each way to get to school starting at age nine. Um, I, was, uh, I was very motivated to do a lot of different things. Uh, in particular, it was not for a legal career. It was to be either a game show host, a uh, TV anchor, anywhere where I could talk a lot. I guess in that sense, Archis and Gracie fulfilled my dream by inviting me to all sorts of panels. <laughs> um, so then switch gears. I, I was a math and chemistry person all the way through, going to be an actuary and decided um, the, the field didn't suit me. After meeting some actuaries, I decided I'm going to find, find myself again, work for a company in Japan, part got an interest in law. So I came back to the States and started law school at Cincinnati, finished law school in Japan when the earthquake and tsunami hit because corp, uh, GE corporate wanted me to work for them to finish off law school there. A couple of stories I wanted to share for perspective and these experiences might, might, um, might be something that is common amongst others. So my first role was uh, as a litigator, my first First week of it being admitted into the practice of law. I get a call from a CEO of a, it was a, it was a company that made a few billion a year. And to him, my name was one of two things. It could either be Wonton or Chang. That was, that was the name that he decided that he was going to give me. I don't know if that was better or worse than the name he gave to the partner on the case. He was called the fat guy. So we were, we were obviously it was a very difficult client. Um, and on this particular occasion, it was three days into being admitted into the practice of law. I was asked to prepare a letter, five pages. And Ken, or actually, I mean, he would, he would, he would, he didn't call me by so it was Chang or whatever he wanted to call me. You just sign the fifth page, leave the first four pages blank. I'll write it. And I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to do that. I'll call your managing partner and I will fire you. Go ahead. I guess I'll set the, uh, you know, Guinness world record for shortest legal career. The, the good news is my managing partner at the time, he, uh, he decided that we needed to terminate revenue and we weren't going to represent this client anymore. So my, uh, my career goes on. Two and a half years later, after, uh, for the litigators that are attending this, I was part of an in of court. Um, and so I had a monthly meeting and on this particular night I was walking home and I was just talking to some random partner, didn't know him, but a year and a half later, there was a partner that was retiring at his firm that had a robust Japanese practice. And apparently he remembered me from that night walk we had where we were just talking about random things. And so I got the opportunity to, to take over that practice. And so for the next nearly three years of my journey, I was to take, a, take, a, take over this Japanese practice and these Japanese clients I lost some big clients, but I gained some new ones and I learned some new, new skills, business development skills. It was all about creating clients, maintaining clients. Antitrust in the EU? Well, I'm pro-trust. You can trust me, I'll get it done. Licensing for submarines? I played with submarines growing up, I can do it. You know, Thailand labor issue? Love Thai food. We can, we can get this done. So, I, I learned a different perspective. I leveraged that Japanese background, uh, created some you know, great relationships with some key clients. It was difficult for me to let that go and join GM, but it's been great at GM. And now I try to spend a lot of my time outside of the substantive work, focusing on diversity efforts, both within GM and outside GM. And it matters to me because people took a chance on me. You know, I didn't have a 4.0 all the way through college and law school. I didn't go to the best school, I didn't go to Harvard Law, but all these different places trusted in me, regardless of the fact that I may not have been a, you know, English major or whatever, or that I was white or not white. They all just trusted in my work ethic, the perspective and insight that I brought, and I continue to apply those today. So again, I'm honored to be here with my fellow panelists. I hope each of you learned something from today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. 
Thank you to all the speakers. I definitely learned a lot about every single one of you. I'm sure you did. I, was, I saw Arsh and I both nodding vehemently at different, um, at different points of everyone's story. I, I, thank you for um, letting the audience get to know a little bit about you. And I think that provides a lot of context for some of the, um, the perspectives that you'll offer, but also some of the advice that I'm sure you'll be giving to um, some of the more junior lawyers that are listening in today. Ken, you, you started this topic a little bit, but what we're going to shift into is um, a, a, a dialogue on how your a Asian heritage or the identity that you've each uh, shared, how that has played a role in your career and your professional development, whether it has presented challenges or advantages. And I think that depends on, on the, the situation, the setting, possibly the area of law that you've, you chose. Um, or, or shift it into, um, you know, one of the things that we, I didn't hear mentioned today, but it's sort of, well, I guess, Ken, you alluded to it. If you have a foreign language ability and your area of law or a particular client has need for that language ability, you know, many immigrants and children of immigrants or second or third generations will grow up with a second, possibly third language in the home. and irrespective of that experience is like growing up with that foreign, foreign language, that second language, oftentimes a native language capability, it can very much be an extra tool in your air toolbox and, and be a distinguishing factor in your career uh, and with, with the work that you do. Patrick, you, you, I think you were the one that mentioned the perpetual foreigner stereotype. Sometimes having that additional language ability or other distinguishing um, other di differentiators can um, perpetuate certain, um, it can create certain perceptions in the workplace and as you advance in your careers. And when it's in, in a, uh, at a prep session, for those in the audience, we discussed, you know, teasing out some of these different um, topics based on our experience. And I thought, Patrick, perhaps you might tee us off on that. Sure. Um, well, I'm not fluent in Chinese. I think I can speak well enough, but if I were to be dropped off in mainland China, I think I'd, I'd have a little trouble getting around. And that's actually kind of a good segue into what I was gonna talk about around this perpetual foreigner stereotype because we didn't speak Chinese in my home. We actually spoke English and that was intentional. One of the challenges that I, um, that persisted in my upbringing and kind of um, bled its way into my early career stages was something that I struggled with that I call invisible minority syndrome. And this is really kind of the, the mindset that I was taught that as a child of immigrants, we need to assimilate as fast as possible into Western culture so as to not stand out. Um, you know, this, this can take the, the form, di different forms, but basically the principle around it was keep your head down, work hard, let your work speak for itself. The, you know, you can pick your, your, your ancient proverb around the loudest duck gets shot, the tallest nail gets hammered down, it's, it's partially fear-based, you know, saddled by generations of cultural learnings. It's also, you know, coupled and compounded with the fact that, you know, first and second generation immigrants struggled with this misperception of being foreigners. Um, and so this is something that I had to kind of identify early on and overcome. I think the problem that I found was that there, the fallacy, for example, is that it's not the responsibility of my managers or my bosses to know what I'm working on. And it's not fair or reasonable for me to expect them to proactively be aware of my contributions because in a company like Accenture, you have hundreds or thousands of employees. So I found early on my work doesn't speak for itself. I have to speak up about it. When I do so though, it's not something that puts me in the penalty box. It's about um, letting people know what I've contributed and what I bring to the table and letting them draw conclusions on their own. I think another, another kind of cultural influence that inhibits this mentality that I had to overcome is the idea of being super polite, right? Asian Americans, I think Ming Shuen, you, you mentioned this about the perception of being quiet. There's this kind of expectation that we have to be very polite, um, deferential and respectful to authority, non-disruptive, 
And, and, and so if you, if you make yourself visible, if you put yourself out there and you're talking about your accomplishments, then it's, it can be perceived as bragging, which isn't polite. And so when I, when I looked, when I stepped back and I looked at all of these things, I realized that this is actually not conducive to taking your career journey into your own hands in corporate America. So, I mean, while it might be great for personal values or family or community values, it's not something that necessarily reconciles with the way uh, career-driven and ambitious attorneys in corporate America operate. Because oftentimes you'll find that the people that are most successful are the ones that are, are visible and known. And so what I did was I had to make a commitment to understand in myself how to make myself visible, how to battle this inherent compulsion of not over-rotating to being deferential and polite and quiet, um, but also doing it in a tactful way that isn't diminishing the, the contributions of others. It doesn't make me uh, look like I'm trying to steal the spotlight all the time. So one of the key things that I committed to doing and put into practice early on was I decided that I would never leave a meeting the same way that I entered it. So if, if someone invited me to a meeting, they obviously thought I had value to add. And so it was my job to make sure I contributed something meaningful. And I wanted to make sure that I left an impression or at least made sure that people knew that I had attended the meeting rather than just being a fly on the wall or a passive participant. And this is tough because, you know, I applied this even when there were meetings where there were much more senior leaders involved than I was. So it, it does require a bit of tact, a bit of discernment, because it's not about being boisterous just for the sake of being heard. But again, it's, it's making sure that I am battling my own internal compulsion to be, to, to, to be reserved and quiet. Also letting people know, hey, I'm here. You know, I have something to add of value. And, you know, this it's a fine balance because it's not denying my authentic self. It's not denying my cultural identity of being an Asian American and a lawyer, but it it's a practice or a discipline that I that I figured out how to compartmentalize some of the cultural identity that I could leverage as a strength, and then some of the ones that could lend itself to misperceptions. Does that make sense? That's really interesting. To, uh, but it just, can you repeat that again? You, all, you want to, you strive to leave a meeting I, I, different I, I, from the yeah. I never wanted to leave a meeting the same way I entered it, was my goal. <laughs> I like that. That's one to hang on to. Especially with the number of meetings, I'm sure, that every single person gets invited into. But um, that's a very good piece of advice. Yeah. I think that uh, I really liked you know, one of the things that Patrick was saying about um, kind of over-rotating to politeness, um, because I do think that that's sort of a fairly common thing that, uh, or I guess common among sort of many Asian cultures, I think is, you know, to show sort of a lot of politeness. And um, I have seen that here as well, right? In terms of the relationship. And <clears throat> well, I think that that can work um, in kind of a more predominantly kind of Asian sort of business environment. Here, I do think that kind of over-rotating to politeness can actually, um, sort of devolve some of your power, right? Because it creates this dynamic of sort of undue deference towards um, the other people in the conversation. So I, I, I kind of hesitate, like I'm not sort of saying be a jerk, right? It's, but it is finding that right balance um, in establishing your persona, right? And, and uh, especially um, these days where you know, increasingly like LinkedIn and kind of other things, the 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 need to self promote and to kind of create your identity or your brand is um, an increasingly sort of important part of what we do in our careers. You do kind of have to um, uh, strike that balance, right? And and I think Patrick makes a really good point about um, making valuable contributions to the meetings that you participate in and you know i've spent sort of countless hours thinking about that like what is the right way to um to to make a contribution to a meeting right and 
sort of not being too early, not being too late, you know, looking for, you know, kind of <clears throat> because the contributions you make to a meeting can help establish your own brand as, you know, I don't know, you know, the big picture person, the really organized person, um, you know, the kind of great at complex legal issues person, kind of any number of things that might, you know, align with your interests. But I do feel like that can be an important um, um, part of, of uh, uh, sort of thinking about the impact of your identity and the development of your career. And George, did you find that in as you just attain seniority within your organizations or just in your career that as you're trying to find that balance, the over, I mean, whatever, we're coin, we've coined it, Patrick, it's the over rotation. The over rotation, how did, did you find a shift in that balance as you became more senior? Because I could see that happening, that as a more junior member, you might over rotate in a certain way, but it becomes compensated as you become more senior, whether it's by title within a higher, within the hierarchy of organization, as you become more senior, it's then recognized because of your position or role within an organization that you are a lead, a head of a department or a senior lawyer. And perhaps then the, the steps that you take to adjust for the over rotation, perhaps you might just adjust, you might turn the dial in different directions depending on your position within an organization. Did you find yourself making sure. that shift? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree. I mean, and I think part of that obviously is sort of as a, as a new person um, or a new employee, you're really kind of just putting your head down, you know, trying to do learn as much as you can. And obviously, um, you know, it's correct that we sort of defer generally to people more senior because they're expected to know more and kind of all of that. But I think that sort of, you know, in terms of thinking about the, 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 the brand or the, the, the uh, role that I wanted to play, um, you know, I really spent a lot of time kind of trying to be um, like really good at sort of focusing on the big picture and thinking about sort of, you know, the the sort of two, three, kind of four degrees implications of what we were doing. And, you know, in terms of the kind of that politeness sort of balance, you establish your own expertise, right? And then folks will start to relate with you. And so kind of, kind of coming back to this point of, you know, not being a jerk, right? It is still important, I think, to be incredibly respectful and to create the kind of the community that you want with folks. Um, but as you develop your expertise, uh, I do think that that changes the dynamic and you become obviously a bit more of an expert. So um, that has helped me as I have felt more comfortable sort of saying, you know, okay, like I listen, I'm hearing your kind of contrary viewpoint, but, you know, I think that there are still important things that I've identified that we need to discuss and so forth. And so it is uh, for me been trying to look for or identify the source of, you know, potential disagreement or conflict and thread that path kind of towards the solution. And that's obviously been aided by um, having more subject matter expertise, having more leadership and management expertise, et cetera. Um, and that has um, allowed me to establish, I think, you know, what I think of as, as a better dynamic. Thank you. So um, I was struck by uh, Patrick's comments, and um, I do think we all have to be very intentional, and it sounds like you set up those, those goals for yourself that were consistent, and one of the things I was thinking about was that it's, it's an ongoing thing for us. It's like a lifelong process, and um, just recently, actually, within the last year, you guys will, uh, this will um, be obvious because I was part of a a project celebration. And we had a virtual celebration during the pandemic and we had, I'd worked with these folks for a long time, all virtually. Um, but we did as an icebreaker for this celebration, a two truths and a lie icebreaker. So, oh, okay. Um, right? so I went all out and I tried to develop really good things. So my uh, entries were uh, one, I watched every movie in the Fast and the Furious franchise. Two, I was a state champion in cross country. And three, I once slept in a tent every night for six weeks. So, so don't, don't tell me what you think the lie is. Um, but uh, I, I won that game and I was really happy. I was like, oh, I came up with really good stuff. 
Um, so I, I went to Duke, so I camped out for basketball games for long periods of time. Um, during the pandemic, I actually, uh, my, my husband and I decided to watch all the Fast and Furious movies, which are phenomenal if you love car crashes and watching Vin Diesel, like, say really funny things in a very slow way. Um, and I actually did run cross country, but I was really bad at it. And so no one guessed my lie correctly. And I, I realized like even so long in, I'm, I was kind of unknowable, right? And there was probably something about me being a little bit of an outsider that made it so that I wasn't making the connections that are really critical for advancing in corporate America or even in the law firm. Um, so I think it's, it's like a, you know, a lifelong process for us to continue to advance. Yeah. Ken mentioned networking earlier and how important it is to build the network, the client relationships, business development. And it is something to, um, to, to work at and work to work on. Whether or not you have a natural aptitude or not, you have to be intentional as well. Yeah, and just one comment for me is this notion of the perpetual foreigner kind of really sinks in for me, given that in the U.S., I felt like I was a foreigner. I'm Asian. In Japan, I'm a gaijin. I'm a, I'm a foreigner. So wait a minute. Where is home? <laughs> and I realized home is wherever I am. It's wherever I make it, wherever my family is, wherever they come with me. Whether that's right now, you know, we're here in Michigan and we love it and uh, we're going to be here. And, um, but I, w I wanted to, one, one additional thing is I do remember when um, starting off, I, I wanted to be a great lawyer, not, not utilizing any of the language skills. I wanted that to be secondary. I wanted them to realize how the quality of the briefs that I write, the quality of my oral arguments in court. And, um, and I think I, I probably overcompensated too much to, to a degree that I refuse to almost use. I think, I can't remember who it was um, uh, that mentioned, you know, just not having English raised. I think it was, it was Patrick in your, in your childhood days, not having Chinese spoken. I, I went into a no, no Japanese or Spanish mode, and I was relieved to kind of be able to use it again and help help Japanese clients go into Mexico and be able to use all three when I when I switch firms. But um, what I would say is that we shouldn't be afraid to use the language skills if we have it. You will be a great lawyer regardless because you have the drive and the determination and everything else. But um, I just I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that we we bring a unique perspective and cultural awareness that regardless of the language skills, we have a unique identity and a unique perspective and we always have something to bring to the table. And so whether or not you, know, you, you do have to be tactful about when you raise your voice or opinion and finding the right moment, but I would just say you, you should never be afraid to voice your opinion because it is an important one. So. Just my two cents. Thank you. And I think that also it, it becomes um, a bit of a natural segue to our next topic, which is a shift from the personal to what you've experienced and witnessed within your organizations. You've touched on that a bit, particularly Ken at GM um, and a bit at Accenture, Patrick. But you know, I invite you to to discuss and share your observations on the achievements towards diversity, achieving diversity, equity, inclusion for Asian Americans in the legal profession, again, with, with your current organizations or in some of your past organizations, because we have a mix of in-house experience um, within corporate America and, of course, with law firms and also geographic um, diversity, uh, including based on what you've shared, Ken. In, in particular, if you could address some of the steps or actions that your organizations have taken that you think have been effective at achieving or strengthening DEI goals within your organizations, um, 
or with the selection of outside counsel or how they staff matters um, on which you have awareness. And I thought, uh, given the composition of our speakers today, we would invite Ken first to offer his perspective from General Motors, and then George to offer his perspective from the Bolion Group. Why don't you kick it off, Ken? All right. So I think um, we should kind of recognize that there, there have been a lot of uh, events that have triggered recent, you know, corporate movement towards ESG. Um, at General Motors, we, we have done a lot prior to, for example, prior to last year's tragic death of uh, George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and, and everything else that happened. Um, but I, I do want to kind of maybe talk through at least GM's approach. It's certainly not the only approach I think is a unique story to tell um, in that after the, the George Floyd tragedy, our, our chairman and CEO sent a note to our entire company. And I, I think it was a good trigger point, an inflection point. It said to stop asking why. Stop asking about why things happen or why this, why that. And instead, we should ask, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And she laid out what she's going to do. She said, you know what? We're going to start off by setting up an inclusion advisory board. It consists of both internal and external stakeholders, leaders, to help us toward the goal of, and this is a new thing too, our goal is to become the most inclusive company in the world. Bold statement. And she's repeated it multiple times, including at conferences this year. We announced we would donate $10 million to support organizations that promote inclusion and racial justice. We already donated a million of it towards uh, the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. But it's not about the dollar amount. It's about the kind of the attitude, the mindset. We named our first ever Chief of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And uh, she's, she's here now to develop and execute strategies that are going to accomplish this bold goal and create a high-performing, inclusive culture. But more important than all of this, I think, was most significant was that we have these things called GM behaviors. Be bold. One team. And winning with integrity. There, there are a lot of behaviors that we are expected to have being here, and especially the executives who are supposed to, the people leaders that are supposed to implement these behaviors on a daily basis. Well, we now have a new one. The new behavior is called be inclusive. What does this mean? Well, if now it's a criteria in which all employees, executive and non-executive, are evaluated in their annual performance. So switching gears to how does that translate for the legal staff? Well, Three years ago, when we signed up our 19 strategic legal partner firms, dwindling down from the 300 that we had, you know, we focused on diversity. All right, so what does that mean from a day-to-day -day basis? Well, we set up five pillars, diversity inclusion pillars, to talk about all the different things we want to do from a DE&I perspective, awareness and training, policy reform, education and economic opportunities, financial support, and public health initiatives to benefit those disadvantaged communities. Those are the five pillars, and those that are part of your Mayor Brown's fine GM client service team uh, are, are fully aware. Um, but in addition to collaborating on those, what are we specifically doing about promoting minority utilization? Just Let's just take that example, AAPI usage. We have a dashboard. We have a dashboard that tracks every firm, every practice group within our, within our company, um, and it shows us total utilization, female utilization, racial minority utilization. I can go down to, if I want to know for our litigation matters, what is the racial minority utilization across litigation matters? I could pull that up in 10 seconds. How is Mayor Brown doing overall? To put, pull that up in 10 seconds. And with that data, we, we even decided, you know what? We, we won't use the underlying data, the real data, but we shared the platform in a CLE last year to the ABA 
um, where we talked about how diversity impacts the bottom line for companies. And we showed how you can utilize tools like this to drive dialogue with your outside firms to go, here are our goals. Our, our general counsel set a goal, a target number for how we are going to see and, and see these racial minority utilization figures in particular increase. There was a pledge earlier this year for LCLD, um, the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity and a lot of different GCs were signing up for it. And our general counsel stepped up, Craig stepped up and said, you know what, on a measurement side of things, we're gonna see 20% increase over our current utilization on racial minorities. So that we're gonna constantly push for improved utilization. So all that to say, our work is far from over, but I am proud, I'm very proud of the concrete steps that our entire legal team is taking to make a real difference in reducing the racial inequality and bias. And hopefully it will eventually translate into an effort to promote an equal justice for all as well. So I just wanted to share that story and back to you, Grace. Uh, great. So, um, Thanks very much. I, I thought that was actually uh, what Kenji was saying was was uh, pretty amazing to hear what kind of an organization like GM is doing, um, you know, in terms of concrete institutional measures. Um, and I think that it's nice. I think the the kind of larger firms do have those resources and the willingness to devote those resources towards these objectives. I think is incredibly important. Um, you know, Volion by contrast is we're a 200 person, you know, quantitative hedge fund. So we're much smaller. We, everything is, is a bit more kind of informal. And so, um, these processes are, you know, not nearly as mature or as robust because, it, you know, we're all kind of trying to do everything with, with, um, smaller staffing. But I think that even in this environment, uh, we have, um, been able to um, find ways or um, sort of techniques to improve diversity within the ranks. Um, and, you know, I, so kind of coming back to one of the things that um, Ken was saying in terms of, you know, the, the measures for inclusiveness, right, for employees, um, uh, that's something that really resonates because, you know, this idea of, you know, kind of you measure what matters, right? Um, and the act of measuring causes sort of greater emphasis. And so I know that there has been um, some people are, there's some pushback on, oh, like, you know, these kind of uh, the statistics on DEI representation in various organizations is, you know, overemphasizing, maybe kind of over rotating towards um, these types of things. And, um, but I actually disagree, right? Because like, there are plenty of, um, uh, sort of everyone will sort of say nice things about like, yes, we're committed to diversity and we really believe it, right? But if you're not actually measuring it and saying, you know, which firms with kind of, you know, what uh, sort of statistics and are we improving or or um, or not improving, like all of that actually will help generate sort of more concrete results. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that, um, from our side, you know, one of the ways that we really focused on this is hiring, <clears throat> where um, obviously not like saying, you know, look, we're going to hire um, um, sort of, you know, more of a particular race or gender of people, but realizing that when we looked at our pipeline, when we looked at our current composition of folks, um, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, especially in sort of, could, you know, because we're hiring a lot of um, PhDs, like a lot of those uh, of the people we hire are just referrals from other people who have worked in those programs, right? And um, if the program itself reflects, sort of has a disproportionate skew, that has an influence on who our folks know and who gets referred in. And so um, we have, you know, done even some fairly basic things that like, you know, junior folks are like, hey, if we're gonna go, um, you know, visit campus for campus hiring, uh, let's reach out to all of the affinity groups or, you know, the women's groups and others, and just let them know that they should submit and come in for an interview. Right? so we were trying to do things to kind of just increase the pipeline and get more folks in. Um, 
But I think also something that we've thought about is kind of cognitive bias in some of the processes that we do, right? So, you know, a standard oral interview um, tends to prioritize people who are sort of good at thinking on their feet, who may be kind of charismatic and kind of good talkers, all of which are valuable skills, right? But doesn't necessarily um, prioritize or demonstrate other aspects of a person's ability. And, you know, for many of us, a lot of what we do is heads down work in sort of deeply analytical um, kind of thinking, but that doesn't come out as much during an oral interview. So um, something that we've shifted to is um, we give um, uh, kind of hypos or problems to people, right? So if they make it to a certain point in the process, we actually give them homework and say, uh, before your next meeting, we would like two to five pages um, to answer these three questions. And that has actually been um, tremendously valuable, right? Like we give, like I give my lawyer candidates fact patterns, our quant guys give programming assignments. And so, and it really is hugely illuminating to be able to say, all right, we've got five people who've answered the same question. Let's compare, you know, the analysis, the presentation, um, and kind of all of those things. And, you know, the, the, you know, kind of Google did a study about this, right? What is sort of the, the best predictor of long-term success and performance at a company? Um, and it tends to be long kind of working interviews where you bring somebody in to work on a problem with you and see what they can do, right? If you really want to see what is going to be, um, how they're going to succeed. So we spend a lot of time kind of trying to think about that and engineer our process to um, look for the skills that we want. And, you know, like, of course, the, the fit and the charisma is still important, but I think that we realized that we were maybe underemphasizing certain skills um, in our process. And I think that that can have a benefit for people who may not be um, as comfortable in an oral interview process, but may be great at sort of demonstrating their work. Um, and, you know, kind of similarly, um, something that we're not as fond of in our firm is kind of brainstorming meetings where, because it tends to sort of reward people who, again, are good at thinking on their feet and advocating for their positions in sort of a competitive environment, right? But we're, when we're really looking for the best solution to a particular problem, often we've said, everybody has 30 minutes of homework before this meeting where you are supposed to think about this, submit your ideas in advance. And then the purpose of the meeting is to then, you know, people will, will have reviewed the ideas and then talk about them during that meeting. Um, so in small ways, um, and, you know, we, we don't have quite as comprehensive a plan, but we do look for um, areas where we can be impactful. Um, you know, and the reality is, is sort of hiring, like bringing talent in and keeping talent are, you know, probably the most important thing that knowledge companies can do. And so we have yeah. sort of spent some of our resources on that. Um, so that's it. That's I just really want to. Yeah, please go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to build off of uh, George's comment about hiring because the, you know, for me, the next part of the equation is retention, right? Because our topic today is what, what can be done to advance the promotion of AAPI attorneys. And we know that the data bears out that for employees that have a sense of belonging, they are more likely to stay at their company. So one of the things that Accenture has recently done targeting the AAPI legal community is that we've launched our ERG for all of our AAPI legal professionals. And, you know, that, that kind of was born out of what, what Ken was talking about for the, you know, the recent events over the past year and the rise in violence against the AAPI community and the pandemic. And we just saw a need that there are so many legal professionals in North America that share cultural and ethnic commonalities, and they just need a safe place to come together and share their stories and recognize that they're not alone. And that generates this, this community, this, this sense of belonging. And coupled with that, now, now we have a platform. Now we have a distinct group that can mobilize into action pillars because the goal is about activism and education and awareness and becoming a force multiplier with other communities, right? To, to ultimately accelerate DE&I
uh, your organization and beyond. And so now that we have a, a community of our own, we, you know, we can become a force multiplier to also generate more tailwind and create stronger allyships with other, with other partners. So I just wanted to throw that comment out there as well. And um, I just, I, I don't want to harp on, on some of the same things, but I, it's actually been a phenomenal year, a terrible year in so many ways, but a phenomenal year in a lot of other ways in terms of advancing diversity and inclusion initiatives. And in the same way that um, George mentioned with GM, there's been so much uh, put into resources at American Express, and I'm sure at a lot of, a lot of the other large companies as well to focus on, on these IND initiatives. And those efforts have a real impact. They really matter. And, and sort of, you know, more recently, in light of some of the terrible things happening in our community, um, also significant additional focus on AAPI issues and a lot of focus that we've never received um, and certainly within our organization. So, um, so I, I think that there's the focus has been great. We can utilize the momentum to, to try to continue to advance. And all of the things that we've all been doing actually really matter. I mean, I did want to add that. I, I, I specifically was the beneficiary of a client requiring diversity on a matter when I was at the law firm. And I, I kind of found that out on the back end. But I was like, oh, I got staffed on this case because this client said, I want diverse talent on my matter. And so when, when organizations put those kinds of requirements in place, and, and at Amex, we ask that our matters be staffed 50% with diverse, uh, diverse lawyers, whether that's gender or any other race, ethnicity, um, I, I do think it can make an impact early on and then hopefully as we move up with people becoming more senior. That's great. That's great. One of the things I wanted to share with um, the participants today, uh, the, 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 the panelists, and we've discussed amongst ourselves a bit, and we teed this off in the invitation to today's um, seminar. But, you know, something that was brought to my attention by the leads of Mayor Brown's Asian American Affinity Groups uh, is a study um, from 2017, so it's a little dated, but it's um, a, a study published by Yale together with the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association entitled A Portrait of Asian Americans in the Law. And it's significant in that, to my understanding, it was the first ever comprehensive study of Asian Americans in the legal profession. And um, one of the co-authors of this report is, the Cal is California Supreme Court Justice Goodwin Liu, who has focused on this area. And while there are many interesting findings in that report, what, I, what I'd like to share with the group is this. According to the study, which did include focus groups and then a national survey of about 600 Asian American lawyers, Asian Americans have been the fastest growing minority group in the legal profession for the past three decades, but have made the conclusion from the report is that they've made limited progress in reaching the top ranks of the profession. Asian Americans comprise about 5% of lawyers in America and about 7% of law school enrollment. And that's just an, a statistic to, to, to keep in mind. After law school, Asian Americans are more likely than other racial or ethnic groups to work in law firms or business settings. And so Asian Americans are the largest minority group in big law firms, and yet they have the highest attrition rates. And then on this point that we've started to discuss, many Asian American attorneys reported experiencing and this comes from the executive sum the, the summary within the report, inadequate access to mentors and contacts as a primary barrier to career advancement. They reported being perceived as hardworking, responsible, logical, careful, quiet, introverted, passive, and awkward. By contrast, few of those surveyed reported being perceived as creative, assertive, extroverted, aggressive, or loud. Very interesting descriptors. Do they feed into stereotypes? Is it self-perpetuating? A very interesting descriptors to be found in that report. And what I wanted to ask and invite the speaker to speak on is, does that research, admittedly, it's a one-time research based on a certain pool of respondents for 2017, but, but hearing that, does that 
jive? Does that research match your own experience or what you've experienced over the past several years, again, organizationally, within your community, uh, within your current organization? And um, it, it, it'd be interesting in hearing your direct response to that. We've started that conversation a bit today. Mingxin, I think I think you just because of what you just shared, let me start with you. Yeah, um, you, you know, unfortunately, I think it it does resonate. Um, I think that we've made a lot of progress in the the many years that I've been practicing law, but still not a lot. You know, there's I, I was reading. You know, we have this broken ladder to the top for Asian Americans. And, um, you know, I will say in all of my, you know, I, I, I see that. And so I, I do think we need to, it needs to be a focus area in order to make change. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's been lacking, which I touched upon is, is the Asian American focus in particular, because like you said, there are these specific unconscious biases with respect to Asian Americans. And there are uh, pers these stereotypes for Asian Americans, and we often teach I and D with a focus not on Asian Americans. And I'm not saying it should only focus on Asian Americans, but we need to be part of the conversation. So all of these these notions that people have, all of those sort of terrible things you mentioned about lacking executive presence and not being creative are exactly the kinds of things that you need in order to break the ladder and move up, um, especially, I would say, especially in, in a large corporate environment. Um, and, and in law firms, too, where you need to make that jump from being a really phenomenal legal research writer, able to analyze, counselor, to being able to develop business where all of those other things are matter and are perceived as really mattering. So, you know, in order to make those connections. So it, it's all tied in together, but um, I, I do think that it's, it's something that has to be a focus and, and that um, I, think, I think everybody's mentioned this, but we have, we have the ability to use our collective, um, you know, power to sort of demand these kinds of change in our in our various organizations and at the law firms as well. Ken? Sure. Um, I, I think it I, I think it definitely reflects the, the reality that I've seen. Um, I think that to, to Ming Shin's point, I think we have seen progress. I think I remember seeing um, a stat from, and, and again, this was, you know, a while back, but it was like the, when you compare the ratio of associates to partners, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Asian American group demographic did, did the worst. And so we have a large contingent of associates and uh, very few partners to, to go with that. So. Um, and even though this data is from, you know, the years between 2015 to 2017, 2018 timeframe, um, I, I'm starting to see some, some, you know, improvement along the lines, but I do think that there is um, some level of, I, I have not seen it at GM and certain other companies, uh, but overall, just based on the, the continuous dialogue I, I have maintained with people outside of GM, it, it is at least felt. It is, it is at least felt within law firms, within companies that somehow they can't get over this hurdle of why is it that, you know, I'm putting in more hours, I'm, you know, I'm sleeping in a sleeping bag in my de under my desk, I'm doing all this, and uh, wh wh why is it that these other people are getting promoted to an executive role or uh, partner role, but not me. And so I, it seems that sentiment still is uh, pervasive. And um, but there are we have ideas. I think of of maybe tips on what how we view getting through that barrier. So I'm I'm sure we'll talk about that in a second. But I'll, I'll just stop there. Well, what do you think would make um, the difference? 
um, or so some suggestions for, for promoting um, or advancing the promotion of Asian American lawyers into leadership positions. I mean, some of the, the, the feedback for, or the, the, the findings for the report are, are the lack of, I don't know if it's lack of access, I guess it's that lack of access to mentors and contacts. Are there any suggestions or tips or advice on that? Okay. Yeah, well, we can we can dive right into it. The um, on the on the early stage front. I mean, let's just just so we kind of go through the entire chain. I you know one example of making sure there is interest in the legal profession. Um, I remember I had uh, we were a gold sponsor for an event. We had ten tickets. We had five taken, um, but. We had five extra tickets and I decided, you know what, why don't I just reach out to five local law schools and I'll just randomly invite an AAPI law student to join us. There's, it's like a big conference and they can meet all sorts of law firm folks, in-house folks and, um, and give them a sense of what it's like in the real world. There's very few law students at the event. Why don't, why don't we just invite them? And all five law schools I reached out to said, uh, absolutely, we'd be thrilled to have somebody join join your table on the conference, and, and all the way through to kind of um, the the current topic of how do we get them more visibility and opportunities. Uh, I know Ming Shane was um, talking about how how she received that opportunity to be involved in a matter, and and we can do the same thing. I remember staffing a matter. I remember a firm that was uh, supporting me for for an M and A deal, and I specifically told them at the outset. I said. You know, I work crazy hours. I'll admit it. There are, you know, there are times when I will be emailing at 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. And what I need you to do is you're a global firm. What you're going to do is create a diverse team. I want somebody from the West Coast, East Coast, London, Middle East, staff it appropriately. I want a diverse team. I want to see it. And you know what? They they got a chance to work together with colleagues that they you know had never previously worked together on, and it created a, a new dynamic. But it it worked out well. The deal turned out well. I got responses in a timely fashion at the time that I wanted it because somebody was always awake, so it benefited me. But but um, but beyond that, I think if we can talk about managing matters and being conscious of providing opportunities for People, whether it's on a particular matter, you want somebody to take a lead role, or hey, this person's taking a lead role. What about how how is your firm allocating origination credits? Or you know, you can have a number of different ways to approach it from an in-house counsel perspective, and then from a law firm perspective, just being mindful of these these stats that we've seen in these studies are not are not good, but I think just the awareness, it all starts with awareness. So once you're aware of it and there is a desire to change it, then action will come. So if, if there is no awareness at your organization, I would say start with that and then develop that into some action plans and slowly promote kind of a more inclusive, diverse workforce and uh, you know, law, law firm, associate, partner, whatever the case is, just the more they're utilized, the more prominent of a role they get, the more likely at the end of the year when the partnership discussions are taking place, the more likely they will become partner. And in the executive role for in the corporate environment, there's there's going to be uh, a number of other, you know, um, it's not all about billing and origination. It's going to be new factors and other other kind of factors play into the equation. But um, you just need to find out what those behaviors are and find a way to create those right mentors and people that will back you up when it's time for that opportunity to, to go to the next level. So I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I'd like to hear what the others have to say. Maybe, maybe Ken, I'll, I'll just follow up on what, what you said, uh, because I, I think Ken doesn't just talk the talk. He walks the walk. I know that when uh, we had, in the days when we had Napaba in person, uh, I remember that Ken had a lunch with a number of, uh, of Mayor Brown lawyers. And I, I think it just helps enormously because uh, the group of us who had that lunch, in addition to having this terrific conversation, both about GM in general and diversity efforts in particular, but we could bring that back to the law firm 
and let, let our colleagues know about this relationship. I, I think it helped uh, some of our associates who are up for a partner to be able to demonstrate, just as an example of their many connections, but, but this additional connection. And I, I, just, I just think that those kinds of connections between businesses and the law firms can really help. And, and I, I'm grateful to Ken for doing it, and I'm grateful to, to our other panelists who, who generate that energy. I, I think that really goes far because, you know, I, I, think, I think our firm has done a very good job over time, and, and I, I've been now a partner for 12 years. Increasingly, I've seen an emphasis on diversity. But, uh, but kind of to a point that Ken makes, nothing helps more than demonstrating that there is there is a, a business case for diversity. I think we are increasingly doing better on the moral case and then the last few years have, have demonstrated that. But but I have to say that that having that business case as part of the, the sales pitch internally has has made a has made a difference. And I'm thankful to Ken and, and uh, people like Ken for that. No, no, I was um, thinking a little bit about or kind of reflecting on what um, Ming Shen was saying in terms of the um, kind of the diversity requirements that, you know, had been put forth on some of the staffing assignments. And, um, you know, I, I think it is it, it, it's a great forcing mechanism, right, to get people in front of an audience, right, that might not always be there. And it's a great way to kind of force your outside law firms to have that conversation about who they're staffing on their deals. And so, um, you know, I know that that people might think of it as kind of like a blunt instrument, right? Which it is, right? But I, I, I think it, I think we've all seen sort of that representation matters and sort of having people, seeing people on teams and kind of working with them, you know, absolutely is critical, right? Because that's how you form the relationships and all of that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, as I was thinking about this question, you, you know, kind of thinking about, Sort of my own career, I think from a more personal level, um, it, it's kind of coming back to something that Patrick was saying, where you know we really believe that kind of putting our head down and doing the work would be the path to success. And you know, after doing that for many years, kind of early in my career, I um, quickly realized that it is a necessary but not sufficient condition, right, to do the hard work. And you really do have to. Um, develop the additional skills or you know we kind of we know what the missing ingredients are and i think that relatively kind of quickly after i kind of came to this realization that you know spoiling away and billing whatever it is 2500 you know hours a year was just like like it gets you something right but not nearly as the, the benefit it gets is not nearly worth the cost it imposes on your career versus spending a couple hundred hours doing something else um, and focusing on the skills that you need, whether it is kind of networking or you know presence in meetings or kind of all of those other things. And so, um, you know, I I tend to kind of think in sort of you know five year plans, and I would really sort of say like where do I want to be, you know, five years from now, and what is it going to take for me to get there, and what skills do I not have for connections and other things, and so. I do think it is important for the individual to kind of continue to develop in those areas so that, um, you know, when the opportunity comes along, right, it's sort of a, you know, I don't really believe in good luck, but I believe in making your own luck, right, and being ready when the opportunity arises to have kind of the necessary skills or to kind of seize on that moment. Well, on that note, in terms of Reflecting on the past and then looking into the future, but hopefully it's a, a bright outlook. I think I think Ken already mentioned sort of some of the the change that you've already seen since the, the you know the, the report that we've been talking about is based on 2015 studies from the time period 2015 to 2017. But what have we observed in the past four or five years, and what do we see in terms of the, the future outlook for Asian American Pacific Islander lawyers, you know, in in, in this profession? And what I'd like to close with is is to ask each of the the speakers. How do you see the legal profession changing for Asian Americans who are practicing in terms of achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion within their organizations? What role do you see we, and this is the collective we, we have in-house counsel represented here, buyers of the work, as well as providers of the work. We've talked a little bit about staffing and demanding that staffing you know, reflect a certain composition. Yeah, what role can we play collectively in moving that needle and 
in the positive direction. And it sounds like it's continuing to move the needle in that positive direction. And this is a bit of a grab bag of questions. If you did have one piece of advice for the, the junior lawyers um, who are listening in, who are attending today's session, what would that advice be? We've touched a little bit about mentorship. Um, I, I really um, I take note to Patrick's no, um, comment about not leaving a meeting the way that you entered it. I wrote that down to share with my team. But I would like to open up uh, the floor to uh, that last topic. Perhaps we'll ask Patrick to speak to this first. Sure. I'll, I'll just ha I'll just make two final points on this. Um, the first is, as lawyers, our sphere of influence is massive. Right. We, we have the attention of the media, business leaders, politicians, legislators. So the opportunity is there and, and we're at a cultural turning point like I've never seen before where the focus is on DE&I and AAPI community in particular. So if you're the only Asian lawyer on your project or on your team, don't bemoan that as evidence that your workforce is lacking in diversity. Take that as an opportunity to be the, the mouthpiece to share the stories and amplify the delta between the excellence that Asian American lawyers produce and the disparity uh, in how we're perceived or treated. So you have to have those hard conversations. You have to share your stories in order for uh, allies to understand what we've struggled with. And the second point I'll make here is this, DE&I to me is much broader than just AAPI. So it, it, there, there may be a temptation to view it as our, our struggles or our challenges are mutually exclusive, but they're not mutually exclusive from the challenges and struggles that our Black and Latinx and LGBT and other communities face. So the idea is we should not operate in a silo. I mentioned the term force multiplier earlier. We really need to create and form these allyships with other, uh, other communities because it, the the goal is for true inclusion to occur. We're all invited to the table. It's not a race, even if we had a slower start, right? It's not about the first community that gets there wins the prize. So we all need to uplift each other. We all need to do it collaboratively and form those partnerships. So th that's what I would end with. Thank you, Patrick. Ming Shen? Um, so thanks again for, for hosting the conversation. A couple final remarks for me. Uh, there was something I think in, in Justice Liu's research that also indicated that there was a declining population of Asians um, uh, going into law school um, as a result, potentially as a result of some of these things. So uh, I was a little bit disheartened by that and I still think that being a lawyer is a great profession, um, very challenging. So um, I agree with everything that um, all of the panelists have said about the way that we can move the needle. One of the things that I did want to just touch on a little bit more is after you put in all that work with, you know, making an impact in every single meeting, you do really need also to have those mentors and sponsors who are in those critical meetings talking about talent um, that have your back. And so on top of all of the work necessary to kind of make that impact for yourself, you probably also need to invest some time into identifying those people who will speak up for you. And that's really hard, but it's also very doable, very manageable. So uh, that's one of my additional tips to, to our more junior folks. Thank you. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you get some phone calls or emails <laughs> after this session. Ken? All right, I'll, um, I'll keep it short because I want to hear George's uh, finale here. Is, um, <laughs> um, I, think, I think we have a, 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 what's that? There's a big setup here. There, that's right. Um, I see a bright future ahead for us. There's, um, we're coming together. We've seen a lot of movement over the last year. And I think the phrase, it's not a moment, it's a movement is, is probably an accurate one. I think, um, I think the, the collaboration I've seen and the awareness and just the more um, uh, inclusive nature of the, the dialogue that I'm seeing around is, is I think uh, foretelling of things to come. And so, I am hopeful for it, and I will certainly be driving towards it. And in terms of the one piece of advice, I wanted to at least end on a note about for, for people individually about, well, how do you grow professionally? And I think 
Um, I've always followed the motto of I, I carry around a couple of dice and I say, when it comes to your career, roll the dice. And what does that mean? And there's two dice, right? So for each letter of dice, I, I kind of have words associated with it. So for the letter D, I say it's drive and determination. You need the passion, find your passion, go after it. For the I, it's insight and influence. You need a deep understanding of your clients. Are you covering the media? Are, are you looking at media coverage about your client? Do you know how their business is run? Do you look at their SEC filings to see what matters to them? With all the understanding that you have, you can then provide that insight and advice that will translate into a larger influence. The C, curiosity and courage. You need to learn. Never stop learning. Information that you learned last week may be obsolete. So keep going. Don't be afraid. Step up and try something new. Who knows? You might just like it. E is empathy and engagement. We need to be aware of other people's perspectives and their emotions. With that empathy, you can then connect and engage more fully with those around you. If you can do all those things, I have no doubt that you have a bright future ahead. That's all for me. George. I think I'm gonna have a hard time following that one. I, uh, um, so, you know, in terms of kind of how I see the legal profession changing, I, I do agree with, um, you know, what the other panelists were saying, right? I think that the future is looking up and, you know, something that has been, I think, a really interesting lesson for me is, um, you know, we lived in New York for 20, some years uh, before we moved out to the Bay Area. And, um, you know, even though New York is pretty darn diverse, um, the sort of number of Asian folks on the West Coast w was really kind of took me by surprise, right? It is just, it's very, there's, it's just many more, it's much more prominent kind of, kind of everywhere you go. And I think that um, the numbers matter, right? Representation matters. And so as a result, like the, the number of Asian lawyers um, sort of is, I, I think percentage wise is larger. Um, you know, I'm a member of a, of a kind of a, uh, an industry organization, the Bay Area Asian American General Counsel Network, which is quite an acronym, um, but it's like this collection of uh, what it is, 100, 200 sort of Asian American GCs um, at various tech firms out here. And seeing that many um, Asian American GCs has been really eye-opening, right? Because, you know, when I was in New York, I mean, you could kind of count them like, you know, I don't know, on a couple hands, right, but not sort of in the hundreds. And so I think that that, um, you know, I think that that future, I think, bodes well because there are a lot of Asian Americans um, in the legal community moving up through the ranks. And as those numbers increase, I do think um, uh, it'll get there. It'll take a little while, obviously, but I think that the future is promising. Um, you know, I, kind of thinking about the piece of advice, I, I think I took a slightly more personal angle. So. Um, I, I, I'm going to go with this, um, which is, you know, I think life is too short to work with sort of toxic personalities and toxic environments. Um, and, you know, I, I think that by working in a variety of places, I was able to kind of realize what I liked and what I didn't like and where I felt like um, the organizations were kind of going to be more supportive or less supportive of the things that were important to me. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there's, we are sort of seeing this shift, right? Where I think when, in our parents' generation, right? Our parents were always like really happy to have the job and really just grateful to the company for the job that they provided. And I think these days, especially with, you know, the, the, the people who report to me or, you know, the younger folks on my team, um, it's much more, the, the power shifted to the employees, right? Where are you going to give your time, your really your life to helping an organization improve and be better? And you can choose to do it at places that are sort of not so great and respectful or places that are really committed to trying to make improvement. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think by, by working in some places where I felt like that were less supportive, I realized, you know, this is not a place that I want to kind of keep coming back to day after day and spending 10, 12 hours a day sort of, you know, helping them achieve success. 
I would rather work at a place that is more supportive. And I think that's important. Obviously, you can't, you know, that, that only go, kind of goes so far. But I do think, for me, that was a pretty valuable lesson to um, really realize that, like, I, I want to spend my kind of time working at with people and at places um, that I like. So that's it. That's terrific. Thank you, George. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ming Shen, and thank you, Patrick, for joining us today. We uh, have done ex really well on timing. We were exactly at 1:30, uh, well, maybe 1:33. But thank you again. And for those who um, have attended, you know, I I was just re reflecting on this when I was a junior lawyer. I don't remember programming like this being offered. And if it was, it certainly I, I certainly missed it. And I hope that the availability of this type of programming is helpful. And I could see us putting on a part two, you know, shifting the topic um, when we prepared. I know that we're, there were so many different possibilities, but because of this particular moment in time in this country, so both the good and bad that we've all talked about, but if, there's, if there continues to be appetite and interest, and I can tell because I can see 216 participants are still logged in, please let us know. Please reach out to us here at Mayor Brown. Um, I am personally uh, interested and committed to continuing the dialogue. Um, I think there's a responsibility uh, that we have individually and co collectively, um, taking off of something that you shared, Ming Shin, that, we, that the collective power, uh, we can continue to, to move the needle um, in the right direction. And I hope to hear from everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye.